up to 1 Corinthians 15 this evening. If you need a Bible, Luke is still standing so you could uh, catch his attention and ask him to deliver you one. And if you don't know how to open up to 1 Corinthians 15, he'll even open it up for you. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 this evening. And I, I really feel like tonight that uh, we have... Um, the, the message could really target two levels or two phases of believers. Literally, if you're here this evening and and um, if you were to um, evaluate your, your your place or your your spiritual growth, and you'd say, you know, I'm pretty pretty young in the faith, or I'm pretty young in my understanding of the Scripture. Um, and I'll tell you what, there's some just really really foundational understanding about the gospel here in First Corinthians chapter 15, and that would really be a message. You know, as a believer, that I think the first uh, important step for every Christian would be coming to the place where you can, with real confidence and simplicity, share the gospel, to preach the gospel to someone. Um, you, you understand the gospel the moment that you're saved, right? You, you understand the simplicity. The gospel is simple. It isn't complicated. But it, it's a bit of a concern, actually, to preach the gospel. I, I don't know about for you, but it is for me. I want to be really, really careful not to make the gospel something it isn't or take something away from the gospel when I preach it. And so I really want to, you know, especially when people want to argue about the way to share or present the gospel. You, for instance, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, grab a handful of different gospel tracts and just read them and read what a gospel tract says is necessary in order for a person to be saved. And surprisingly, even though the people that write them would all pretty much believe about the same thing about the gospel, surprisingly, there's a bit of a... Divergence, where it seems like the gospel is a little different, uh, depending on how it's how it's presented, and it isn't. The gospel's simple, and uh, if if you're if you're taking notes or you want to remember something in a way that you won't forget this evening, can I just suggest to you two places that every believer ought to begin preaching or sharing the gospel from? John chapter three and First Corinthians fifteen, the text we're in this evening. So John three would be the first one. If you if you're preaching the gospel anywhere before John 3. In other words, you can share the gospel. It's in every book of the Bible. Jesus Christ is the theme of every uh, every book of the Scripture. But if you're preaching the gospel first from another place, um, you're probably overcomplicating or you're, taking too, you're making it more difficult than it has to be. Nobody can preach the gospel better than Jesus. And Jesus shared the gospel in John chapter 3. And the second place to find the gospel very, very simply written is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll read some verses, and then I'm going to introduce us into this portion of the text, which really uh, turns the corner from talking about spiritual gifts and now moves to something practical, which has to do with the resurrection. But uh, verse 1 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul begins by saying, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein you stand. And then verse 2, he said, By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Now, this doesn't finish the context, but this really would be the first message this evening. In other words, I'd say there would be two messages, maybe... This would be one you'd say, Pastor, I've heard you preach this passage a lot of times when you've shared the gospel. Well, that's that's true. And because I don't want to complicate the gospel, I've preached from this portion of Scripture a lot of times. Um, second message this evening, though, uh, in, in, beginning in verse 11, Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believed. And now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, that's verse 12, how say some among you that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain? And your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. And then, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ not be, be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, 
we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And I wish we could delve into the first fruits this evening, but, but uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, naive about how much time that we have this evening. And so we can only go so far in this text. And by the way, there's going to be some great, uh, great opportunity next week to look at a little bit more about tying in with end times in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Right now, let's pray and we'll ask the Lord's help tonight as we get into the Scripture. Father, we do need your help, not only with our understanding, but God, I imagine with all the events that everyone here has on their calendar this evening and tomorrow and uh, just, just the things that we've been through in order to be here tonight, we recognize that we need help just with alertness and concentration and focus. And then, God, we need help uh, to be able to apply the Scripture. Help us not to desire to know things merely so that we can fancy that we're knowledgeable or that we're intellectual, but help us to know things so that we can preach them and so that we can live them. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, that's the Gospel, verses uh, 1 through 4. And... Paul is just reminding this church at Corinth, and you know when he preached the gospel at Corinth, you can read about it in Acts, but he, he said, More of a brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received. How that Christ, or I'm sorry, by which also ye are saved. And then he uses a conditional phrase, and he uses the word if. Now if is conditional, and it, it means in this instance, if this condition uh, this condition is true unless, as long as this other one is as well. Now here's something that people have taken verse 2 and misapplied it to mean, or they've made it to mean it's been a misapplication. It says, unless you have believed in vain. Now, I've had people say, well, you know what, you may have believed, but maybe you didn't believe enough. Or maybe you weren't sincere in your belief, and so you believed in vain. And uh, let me just tell you something. There is no end to that road if you head down it, first of all. If you want to require, make requirements or make um, tests for believing, man, I'll tell you, you can believe the best that you can, and it'll never satisfy you in a season of doubt. The reality of it is that belief is just what it, what it means. And uh, to, to believe really is to just affirm something. Just to, um, for instance, I may not feel something, but I can... Believe it. You ever had somebody ask you just to believe them? You ever had somebody and you and, and I mean the person in their character were, you know, maybe it's something that maybe it's maybe they're keeping a secret. Maybe they won't tell you something and they have to say, you know what? I can't tell you, but you just have to trust me that what I'm what I'm telling you, what you think isn't true, and you're going to find out later what's going on. But you're just going to have to believe me that whatever you think isn't so, or whatever you don't think, whatever it is. You just ask someone to believe you. Well, does that take away doubt? Asking someone to believe you, does it take away doubt? No, not necessarily, but what is belief? Belief is a choice. No, I'm going to choose. I'm going to make this choice. When we believe in Jesus, the illustration of for belief that Je Jesus used for the cross is the serpent in the wilderness. And he used, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Literally, just like when the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up with the brass snake on it, those that were bitten by poisonous serpents, if they looked at the serpent, they were healed. Now, how much do you have to believe to be healed in that instance? Oh, completely, right? Well enough to look. In other words, could you look and wonder whether it will work? Could you say, you know, I really hope this is true. When do you find out it's true? When you're healed, right? How much did you believe before that? Enough to look. And that is the best description. I love it that Jesus uses that illustration for faith, for believing. In other words, I've had people say, well, you know, I know I wanted to be saved, but I don't know if I believed enough. I don't know if I trusted enough. You know, well, I understand belief is putting your full faith, your full trust in. You're not hedging your bets. You know, I'm going to believe in Jesus, and I'm also going to, you know, burn a candle. I'm going to believe in Jesus, and I'm also going to, uh, you know, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to sacrifice to some idols in case there's some help in that. I'm going to believe in Jesus, but I'm also going to. 
No, it's Jesus and nothing else. It's Christ alone. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's not Jesus and, it's only Jesus. I love that phrase, only Jesus. Uh, I, for years, wanted to put it on the tailgate of my truck, but I'm just afraid of when I cut in front of somebody sometime, uh, what the, <laughs> the way they think. So one of you guys that uh, um, are rigorous about the way that you drive, very, very careful, you put it on your back window or something for me, and put John 14, 6 on it, if you would, please. Uh, but I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto, unto the Father but by me. And, well, how complicated is it to, to believe? What's well, as complicated as turning and looking? And how is it that you turned and looked? God, I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. That's how complicated it is. God, I want to be saved. You know, salvation implies guilt. It, it implies an acknowledgement of condemnation, doesn't it? No person, you know, people say, well, you have to confess your sins. My friend, asking to be saved is a confession of sin. Isn't it? You know, people can add, well, you have to pray this way, you have to pray that way, and, and they add all these things. We have to repent. Uh, well, sure. Yeah, you do. You have to repent of unbelief and turn to Christ in belief. And uh, when you turn to Jesus, you turn from absolutely everything. So you could you can, you know, add all these qualifications, but you can't include enough of them. You want to play the you have to repent uh, of whatever game. Uh, you can't write a pamphlet long enough to tell people everything they need to repent of. You, you, you turn to Jesus. You turn from everything. And so that's faith in Jesus. Okay, so that's pretty simply understood. But then the, you know, we have this little twist here in the text this evening. I really want to help you with this. I hope you really get this in case someone has used it against you before when they're trying to complicate the gospel for you. And I hope this will be a help you, that you, for you. That phrase, unless you have believed it. Hi, Tim. You can see we're in 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, that phrase unless ye have believed in vain. In verse 2, uh, notice, if you will please, that there is uh, the, the, the use of that phrase several more times in the text. Will you look down with me to verse 14 of 1 Corinthians 15? Uh, let's, let, let, me, let me read the first phrase and you read the second part. Paul said, If Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. I hope you didn't read that second, the, the last phrase with me. Okay, so I, I guess the third phrase is what I want us to read together. You ready? Okay, I'm going to read the beginning, and then I want you to read, and your faith is also vain with me. Okay? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Okay, so what makes our faith in vain? The object. The object, right? If Jesus isn't risen from the dead, and you believe in the resurrection, <laughs> that's vain. What is the word vain? Vain means empty, useless, uh, without substance. If you would uh, like to comprehend it, I, I don't necessarily agree with this assessment because I have seen, I, I have seen it otherwise. But I've heard people use um, cotton candy for an illustration of vanity. In other words, it seems to have a lot of substance, but man, you shove it in your mouth and it's where to it go? It's just gone. Right? It just disappears. Now, I, I'm going to have to disagree because I'm going to have to be an advocate for the cotton candy lovers out there. And uh, those people don't believe that cotton candy is in vain. I've met people that uh, just, there's nothing that delights them more than to get themselves sick uh, by stuffing that stuff into their faces and so forth. And so it's not vain to them, for sure. Whatever substance there is is enough to satisfy and make them want to do it again another time, a long time later, but another time anyway. Okay, but the idea of is you grab cotton candy, you try to get a grip on it, what do you get? Vain. That's the idea of vanity. Um, something that doesn't have substance to it, doesn't have a lot backing it. Okay, what makes our faith vain, according to our context tonight? Is it because we don't believe enough? No, what makes our faith vain, what would, the hypothetical is, if this is true, then this would also be true. And then the reverse side of that in this conditional clause is that because this isn't true, then this is also not true. You ever had somebody make something for sake of, mark, uh, of argument? Well, if you are that, then I'm the President of the United States. You know, that's the idea. Okay, so if Jesus isn't risen, your faith is vain. That's the idea. Okay, is Jesus risen? Yes. Yeah, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept? Okay, we see it one more time in the use of vain. 
uh, in verse 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, you're yet your sins. Okay, so what is the condition that makes your faith vain? Is it you're not believing enough? You ever had somebody play this game with you? Man, I'm glad. It's been a long time since anyone's done this to me, but I remember being a kid. And people, you know, they, they meet you and they say, are you saved? Well, I got saved when I was four years old. And I grew up in a Christian home. I, I, I just, I, I was privileged. My, my parents were new believers when I got saved. And we went to church all the time. Matter of fact, my dad had started a church and we were pretty heavily involved and we were always involved in ministry type of things. And But every now and again, you know, you'd go to maybe another church's vacation Bible school and there'd be the, uh, the summer ministry guys, neighborhood Bible time would be a lot of times what they would be. And we go to Bible uh, vacation Bible school, and people would ask you. I remember guys would ask, "Are you saved?" And I'd say, "Yes, I'm saved." When'd you get saved? I'd tell them when I got saved. And they say, "Well, did you really mean it? Did you really believe? You know, are you sure you're saved? Are you sure that you're sure? You know, and it's like, uh, you know. And then they ask you, "Well, what did you pray when you, you know?" Uh, and and they, they, say, they want to quiz you. They just want you to doubt or question <laughs> your salvation or how much you believed. Well, the reality of it is that God doesn't want us to be that way about our salvation. And He wants us to have confidence. This context here is not being used, again, to undermine your faith or undermine whether or not you've prayed to receive Jesus as your Savior. This context is helping you to understand the importance of the resurrection. There are some Christians that just seem as though... Uh, vital doctrines of the faith they're willing to uh, set aside. They're willing to say, well, okay, we can, you know, that's one I'm not real sure about. And I was just tell you, the resurrection isn't one. You cannot be born again unless there's a resurrection. Your faith is vain unless there's a resurrection. And Paul, Paul illustrates that, actually. Uh, before we get into that illustration, I want to finish, though, the the gospel here, and I want to point out something else. One second thing about the gospel that's presented here that I think could be a help for you if you want to present it using uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Now that's great, isn't it? Paul is saying how he got saved. You ever had somebody try to play the Calvinism game about Paul on the road to Damascus? You know, when... Paul is on his way to persecute the church, and all of a sudden there's a bright light, and a voice speaks from heaven, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he says, Who art thou, Lord? And, and the Lord says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And so Paul wanted to kick against the pricks. God wanted, uh, Paul wanted to resist Jesus. He didn't want to become a believer, but God met him on the road and just stopped him and forced him to be saved and be an apostle. Paul here shares his testimony. This is how Paul says he got saved. Now, in case anyone's ever gone that route with you and tried to say, you know, Paul could not, it was irresistible grace. Paul could not resist the gospel. And that's just Calvinism that, that's being taught in that. Here's how Paul said he was saved. I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's the gospel. How that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. Okay. So what was the gospel that Paul believed? God sovereignly foreordained and forced him? No, Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. That's the gospel. Now, any one of us could share the gospel in a short sentence like that. We could say it this way. The gospel is that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's the gospel. Now, how many of us could present the gospel that way? Could we? The gospel is Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again. Now, let's delve into it just a little bit because a little bit of explanation might be helpful for some people. Why did Jesus die? He died for sin. His or ours? Our sin. And that implies what? We're sinners, right? Yeah, and uh, so Jesus died for our sin, okay? Jesus was God's perfect son. So you could explain who Jesus is, you could explain what our sin is, but the fact that Jesus died implies those things, doesn't it? Okay, Jesus was buried. Why was Jesus buried? What? 
because he died from our sin and to show that his sin, he was literally took our place, took our death. And he was literally separated from God. He was buried. Jesus rose again. What does that imply? I love the way Colossians puts it. What, what is it? Yeah, we can be risen with Him. Okay? Uh, Colossians says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of the throne of God. Because He's risen, we're risen. And that's the Gospel. You have to believe that. If you reject that Jesus died for our sins, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again. You reject that, you, you, that's, you don't believe. But you have to believe. You say, well, Pastor, you have to believe in the right, the right God. Yes, you do. You sure do. Uh, who's, if you don't, if you don't um, acknowledge that Jesus was God's perfect Son and then His dying on the cross for our sins, it's foolish. Did you see how everything is there? Everything is in, the, in that simple gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And Paul said, that's the gospel that I preached to you. And he said, that's the gospel that you believed. And he said, that's by the gospel that I was saved by. The de death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now that's simple, isn't it? Anyone could share that, couldn't they? You say, Pastor, maybe that's a little bit oversimplification. You know, I wish to God we could believe Jesus when he talks about what he requires for faith. What did Jesus say? What's the manner in which we have to come to him? What? As little children. Now, isn't it incredible how you can tell a child who God has created knowing that there's a God in their hearts? Why is it a child believes so easily in God? Because God made them that way. That's why. And you can tell a child, Jesus is God, and Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And a child can just believe that. And a child will have a hard time understanding how anyone couldn't believe that, actually. Now, how could you not believe that? Why wouldn't you believe it? It just doesn't make any sense to a child why you wouldn't just believe it. But we're just too intelligent. And the reality of it is, is that what Jesus wants is simple faith. Like a child. And um, anyone who's has any degree of intelligence knows that no one's smart enough to know everything. And if the gospel is going to be complicated, the reality of it is I don't think there's anyone intelligent enough to grasp it. I mean, if it's going to be grasped through intelligence and it's going to be a merit-based system, you're going to have to be smarter than everyone else. More intelligent than everyone else. I'm just glad that isn't God's way. God doesn't want intelligence. God wants faith. And you know why people believe in Jesus? You know what motivates people to believe in Jesus? You want to know? They want to. <laughs> you say, Pastor, it's oversimplification. No, it isn't. I know people that have high IQs who are very, very accomplished and that the gospel simply preached to was simply saved. God help us to do that. You know, sometimes we meet someone and they have a title after their name, PhD. And we think, well, I better really, you know, present... I better present an intelligent gospel. This is an intelligent person. My friend, faith doesn't require intelligence. You say, you mean our faith is unintelligent? I didn't say that at all. That's not the point at all. The point is, is that God loves whosoever. It's a whosoever gospel. And if you had to be a PhD to get saved, how many PhDs do we have in this room? See, we'd all be disqualified. Most of us. Isn't that so? Well, aren't you glad? You say, well, Pastor, I'm just as smart as a PhD. Well, you're not a PhD, so how am I supposed to know that? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. The point is, is that the gospel's simple. Okay, I, I don't want to beat that into the ground too much. But here's the deal. I've found that preaching a simple gospel to anyone, intelligent, unintelligent, or less intelligent, however you want to phrase it, with the power of the Holy Spirit and with the witness of the Word of God is enough and that people get saved. You know, we don't present the Gospel because we don't think we can present it intelligently enough. And what we mean by that actually is I don't think I can make it complicated enough for people to understand. And the truth is we need to make it simple enough that anyone could understand it. You could explain the Gospel to an intelligent person, very intelligent, very accomplished person, as simply as you'd explain it to a five-year-old.
And friend, it'll be just as effective for them as it is for anyone else. And you try it if you don't believe me. Now, I don't know how many times I've thought, you know what, I've given all the answers. The person asked all the questions, I've given all the answers, then I haven't convinced them of anything, and I've just gone back to the Word of God. And I just quote the Scripture. I just say, well, you know what, that's a complicated question. Let me give you something simple. You just give them the Word of God and the witness of the Holy Ghost, and then you just speak to what the Holy Spirit is saying. You say, you know, God's Spirit is telling you that this is true. And doesn't the Spirit of God do that? Has the Holy Ghost ever told you something and you thought, you know what? Yeah, that's true. How do you know it's true? Because God tells you so. And you can't really do anything more persuasive than that. You can't be more persuasive than the Spirit of God getting in someone and saying, this is true. Amen. You can't beat the Holy Spirit of God on His power. And so the Gospel is simple. Don't complicate it. All right, I connected a couple of words. One of the words that we connected this evening was the word vain. And I hope that's a help for you to realize that when the Scripture says, unless you have believed in vain, it's not talking about you're trying to believe and not being, not believing enough, not being effective enough in your believing. What it's talking about is if you've believed in vain, what the context tells us, what that means is that if Jesus wasn't risen from the dead, then you've believed in vain. And that's a hypothetical that isn't true. It isn't so, is it? Now here's some things that Paul said also in verse uh, 11. He said, therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach. If you, if you read back, you would see that Paul had said that he had labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. He was the least of the apostles. And so in verse 11, he said, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Let me stomp on this one just a little bit too. You ever heard someone talk about, and maybe, maybe you haven't in, in I'm happy for you if you haven't. But you ever heard someone talk about Pauline theology or Petrine theology? That is, if they're talking about Romans or the letters that Paul wrote, they're talking about the way that Paul explained theological truths. And then Petrine would be Peter's theology. And the notion by scholars is this. Peter, of course, wasn't the student. He wasn't a Pharisee like Paul was. He wasn't trained up under Gamaliel, wasn't a doctor of the law and so forth. And so he wasn't as educated as Paul was. And so when Paul would write letters like Romans, and when he would write about um, the law in Galatians and Colossians, then Paul was really explaining the gospel in a more complex way, in a different way. And he would explain the gospel using the law. Whereas Peter was just a fisherman. And so the only way he preached the gospel was just kind of, Thou art the Christ! You know? And uh, he, would, he had a very, very simplistic way. And so... These individuals, whether uh, deliberately or inadvertently, I don't, I don't know their hearts, but these individuals make it seem as though Paul and Peter preached a different gospel. And, uh, you know, it's interesting the way that Peter talked about Paul. Remember in the, the end of Second Peter when he talked about Paul's letters that he'd written? He said, which, you know, some things were hard to be understood, you know, which you that are unlearned and ignorant do rest. And, uh, and it was, why? Because of the attitude that they had. And so they would try to wrestle the Scriptures or make them say what they wanted to say. And Peter is saying, I'm on board with Paul all the way. Well, here Paul is saying, I'm on board with all the rest of the apostles. In 1 Corinthians 15, 11, he, he's talking about the other apostles. And he said, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believed. He said the gospel all the other apostles preached was that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. That's what Peter preached. That's what James preached. That's what the other Judas preached, not Iscariot. That's what, and you go down the list of all the apostles, and Paul said, this is what we all preach. All of us do. You know, he says, you can write Jerusalem and just check in with the other apostles. This is the gospel. And I like that. I think that's a grand help. Uh, I would like for my dear friends who want to overcomplicate things and they don't want the gospel to be as simple, I'd like them to study this passage of the Scripture and look at it and come to understand the simplicity of the gospel. We'd be far more effective in the church if we were simple in preaching the gospel. And that's what, uh, what God's intention is. Okay, now, now here are the implications. This is message two. If uh, the gospel, if we've believed in vain, that is. Verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some of you that there's no resurrection of the dead? 
Now we know what this is, don't we? These are Sadducees that have gotten into the church. Now how the Sadducees get into the church? Well, same way the Pharisees did. The same way the Gentiles did. How'd they get in the church? Come on. They believe what? They believe the Gospel. That Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. Now, <laughs> but the Sadducees, you know what Sadducees were? They were individuals that didn't believe in eternal life. They believed, uh, like most of the Jews today do, that, you know, we just, you know, religion's really for this life, and then after that we just kind of go into the ground, and, you know, there really isn't an afterlife. And that's why it's not really important for them to really find out the truth about Jesus. They've bought into a lie. They've believed the lie that, you know, there's no eternal consequences, so it's really all about nationalism or all about, you know, the, the, um, the social aspects of what we believe in this life. Friend, the problem is, is that it just isn't true. Remember what the Sadducees asked Jesus when they came to him trying to tempt him? They had the gotcha question. They talked about the Levi, the laws the, of uh, Levite marriage, Leverett marriage. And they asked the question, you know, a man has a wife and he dies and his, you know, because of inheritance, his oldest brother is supposed to marry her and then, and then he dies and the next brother is supposed to marry her. And then and all until seven husbands pass and then and when they go to heaven, whose wife is she? And they're trying to say there can't be any such thing as eternal life because of this complicated gotcha question where there's a contradiction between what the law teaches you know, if that were really the way it's supposed to be and there were eternal life, God wouldn't have written the law that way. And what did Jesus say? You, know, you do are not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. And they just told him, there's just no marriage in heaven. So, <laughs> uh, there's, there, there's, not a, uh, there's, there's an answer, but it's a stupid question. You know, there are, I've ever heard somebody say there are no stupid questions. There are stupid questions. There really are. Sometimes I tell people it's the wrong question. A stupid question is one that cannot be answered. Or one that cannot be answered. Or a question that has a contradiction. You know, it's the old uh, adage, did you, did you stop beating your wife? That's a stupid question, right? Because to say yes or to say no, you know, the answer is yes or no. And this is just a gotcha question. You can't answer it either way. And that was the kind of question it was when they asked Jesus this. The problem was they didn't know that there was no marriage in heaven. And Jesus said, well, you know what? I just tell you something about heaven. There's no marriage there, so your question's dumb. <laughs> I think he used the word dumb. I think that's the way it translates out of the Greek. I'd have to go back and look at it again. Okay. Anyway, uh, so now these are so how did we answer we asked the question before I got off on that little bit of an excursus. Uh, we asked the question, how did the Sadducees get in the church? They got saved, right? Now, were they theologically sound at this point? No. Is every person... This ought to be a help to you. Um, you don't get lost if you get off theologically. A person who's off theologically, if they got saved and they were sound theologically, they're not lost afterward. I've wonder, I used to wonder, you know, if they believe that, that's not, that's not who Jesus is. Or if they believe that, that's not the Gospel. You know, I used to wonder, how can a Calvinist actually be saved? based on what they believe about God. What they believe about God isn't true. And then, you know, I had an epiphany uh, some years ago. They weren't a Calvinist when they got saved. In other words, they were taught Calvinism and because of uh, pride. Usually it's just pride that a person gets off into false doctrine. Uh, sometimes deliberately so. Sometimes people want a following and so they want to believe something unique or something special so that people look at them and think, wow, they understand something no one else can understand or they understand something in a way you know, and the way they explained it, you know, is so, you know, is uh, just so logical, the logic that they use. You can use logic with bad prim with false premises, and anything can seem to be logical. You can, you, can, uh, you can debate or defend anything. It doesn't make it true just because it's intelligently um, expounded on. Case in point, the, the, the more a doctrine is false, the more voluminous the writings explaining it. It's telling you that the, the further off base or the, the more unscriptural a teaching is, the more books will be written to defend it. And their argument always is this. I've had people that believe false doctrine say this. Well, if what you believe is true, then how come there aren't any books written about it? I said, well, there is one. It's very, very simply written. 
And it's so it's so well written that there don't, don't really need to be any more books written about it. You read books that are written by guys that teach false doctrine and they've got, you know, 100 page bibliography where they cite every person that taught the same false doctrine so that they can have collusion or so they can have support in the numbers. Now, mark my words, the more false a doctrine is, the more work, the more volumes will be written to defend or explain it. Because it has to be defended or explained, truth is simple. And truth finds its source in God, and simple people can find truth and be very, very confident about it. I hope that's a help for you this evening. So then Paul uh, goes on to explain, first of all, the gospel that we preach. is It's the same, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that we all preach. But then he addresses the Sadducees. The Sadducees got in the church because they got saved, but then they got off. And he said, how say some of you, in verse 12, that there's no resurrection of the dead? Now, here's some arguments. First one. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Now, all of them, when they believed the gospel, believed what? What's the gospel? Come on. Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again. So Paul here is pointing out the inconsistencies of the Sadducees saying there's no life after death. If you're saying that there's no life after death, then what did you believe? The resurrection of the dead. So you believed in Christ being risen, but you don't believe that you're going to be risen from the dead. You see it? So that's the first argument. First argument is, is if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Jesus isn't risen. Now, Look at verse 6, will you, in, verse, in chapter 15? Actually, verse um, 5. Speaking of Jesus, that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve. Who? The resurrected Christ. So who saw Jesus after he was risen? Peter. Cephas, that's Peter, and the twelve. So the twelve apostles. Um, in verse 6, you say, Pastor, twelve apostles? I thought Judas was dead. Well, they appointed another apostle before he was appointed, one of the requirements to be an apostle was what? <coughs> you had to see the resurrected Christ. So Matthias evidently had seen Jesus after the resurrection. It, that was one of the qualifications when they appointed someone to take the bishopric. That's Acts chapter 2 if you want to study it. But that's just, that's, I, I think that's interesting. It's not a major important doctrine there. Verse 6, after that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are falling asleep. So, a crowd of 500 people saw the resurrected Christ. So, a crowd of 500 people, and, and Paul said most of them are still alive. Some of them sleep. In other words, they've died. Uh, but, 500 people. And so you can look them up. Here's a list of names. Witnesses. Okay, so if you're a Sadducee and you don't believe in the resurrection, but you believe in the gospel, what do you believe in? We believe in the resurrection, right? When they believed, when they believed in Jesus, it was because of the resurrection. That was what the convincer was for the Sadducees. And now they're saying, "Well, I, don't, I believe Jesus was risen, but I don't believe I'll, I'll be risen." Paul's saying, "If that's true, then Jesus isn't risen." And what's the overwhelming, what's the overwhelming body of evidence Paul is throwing in their face? <laughs> you know, Jesus is risen from the dead. So you know what you're saying isn't true. That's a real help, isn't it? Amen. I mean, he's not being timid or, you know, uh, timorous in the way he's presenting this. I mean, he is just like, wham! You, you know Jesus is risen from the dead, and if Jesus is risen from the dead, then so will you be! Well, that's good news. It's great news. Um, another one. He said, we're wasting our time preaching the gospel. He says, what did you believe? What did they believe? You tell me again, just so, just so I know you know. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. Okay. Paul said, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. So Paul said, I preached that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And he said, if Jesus isn't risen, <laughs> I wasted my time preaching to you. Now, was Paul intelligent enough to not waste his time preaching a message that didn't have implications. Right? If Paul knew there was no resurrection from the dead, and it didn't matter, you know, well, we're all just going to go into the ground anyway, like the Jehovah's Witnesses teach. By the way, if you have Jehovah's Witnesses, come by your house. 
Take them to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And so Paul is here saying, you know, I don't know about you guys, but I don't get rocks chucked at me for fun. I don't get beaten. I don't get shipwrecked. I don't go through the perils that I've gone through. I have sacrificed my entire well-being and my lifestyle to preach a message that doesn't mean anything. He said, Jesus is risen from the dead. And he said, if, if Christ are not risen, not only is your faith vain, he said, our preaching is vain. He said, you believe what we preached. He said, well, if it isn't true, we wasted our time preaching it. And then he said, more than that, he said, it goes further than that, it's deeper than that. He said, it's pure evil. And the fact is, is that if Jesus isn't risen, religion or believing in Jesus is pure evil. That's a fact. So you're a fake believer. If you think, ah, oh, you know, I don't, I've never really trusted Jesus. I'm not sure I really believe in God. But you know, I think there's a lot of good in religion. And I think there's good in Christianity. And so I'm just, you know, I'm a quote Christian religiously because I practice Christianity, but I don't really believe in Jesus per se. And you'd be surprised how many people there are. I read a Barna research poll that gave just astonishing numbers of people that are in evangelical gospel preaching churches that don't actually believe, including preachers that preach the gospel. And so Paul said not only would our preaching be vain, a waste of time, he said, but he said, we also are found false witnesses of God, verse 15, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Paul says it's kind of a big deal to be a liar. And he said, if Jesus isn't risen, then the other apostles and myself were false witnesses. In other words, we're charlatans. Just preaching and teaching and telling a lie. Now, there are religious charlatans, and that's the fact, isn't it? There are religious charlatans that claim they preach the gospel, but the gospel they preach, unfortunately, is not that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. I wish the charlatans preached that. I wish, you know, I could tune into TBN and hear one of the popular guys that are rolling in the big money and flying in jumbo jets say, Jesus died, Jesus was buried, Jesus rose again. Believe it, send me a million dollars. If they just include the gospel with send me a million dollars, but it isn't, they say, so, so a seed of faith. <laughs> faith in what? Well, faith in my airplane. So do this, do whatever. You know, you have faith, you believe to be healed, you send me money. Their gospel is send me money. That's their gospel. It's I, 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 Of course, you say, Pastor, I, I don't think they all preach that. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure that's probably true. I don't spend much time uh, following up, but I, I've just had some, some uh, a few experiences and I've just never heard the gospel preached in those experiences but I've heard things called the gospel that aren't the gospel. Benny Hinn goes to India and holds these massive crusades. What he preaches isn't the gospel. It isn't Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. And so they're false teachers. Paul said, if I preach the actual gospel, I'd be a false teacher. And then what's the obvious answer to that? What did Paul gain from preaching the gospel? What was his personal gain? Well, he said what things I... Uh, I um, Counted gain, or I'm sorry, how do you say? Um, wow. Now I, I messed up that that, uh, that scripture. What things I counted gain? No, what things, things are gained for me. Or gain for me, I count a loss for Christ. Those I count a loss for Christ. That was Paul's attitude. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for knowing that verse. I can't remember. I right, better get done here. You guys are falling asleep. Anthony is gone. I mean, he is out. Cold. Let me see if I got something to throw in Hershey's kiss. Hold on a second. Real quick. He worked really hard today. <laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, let's back to it. Now, verse 16. For if the dead rise not, then is Christ not raised. Then is not Christ raised. Okay, so now Paul just brings in the point to the Sadducees. You say there's no resurrection of the dead. If the dead rise not, Christ isn't raised. If Jesus is risen, so are we. If Jesus isn't risen, neither are we. Do you see that? So how do we know there's life after death? The resurrection. The resurrection. Uh, how do we know that uh, you know, we, we have eternal life? Well, because Jesus gave it to us. We, we identify with Jesus Christ. What Jesus is is everything for us. Verse 18. Uh, then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Oh, I'm sorry, we go back to verse 17. Again, another statement. Same, same thing. If Christ be not raised... 
Your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Now, why would a person have believed in vain? just want to beat the dead horse just a little bit. There it is again. Why would they have believed in vain? Not because of their lack of faith, not because of their lack of faith, but because they believe something that isn't true. And the hypothetical not true is that Jesus isn't risen. But is Christ risen? Yes. Go to verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And the Gospels reiterated in the illustration of in Adam I'll die even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But I want to end there this evening. And I want to just, I, I, I jumped over verse 19 and we need it because it's another supporting point that Paul makes. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. And that's a Sadducee. That's a Sadducee. Uh, you know, you heard the old joke that they make about the Sadducees, right? They don't believe in the resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see. Yeah, so, and uh, the reality of it is, <laughs> I still think that's funny, and it, it does, anyway, whatever. The reality of it is, is that Paul said, we're all of all men most miserable. So he said, you're miserable if you don't believe in the resurrection. You ever wonder why some people are so miserable? <laughs> you ever wonder why an atheist is just so angry? Is miserable. You ever wonder why an agnostic sometimes is just so angry, just downright miserable? Now, I've met people that are atheists and agnostics, and they try to, to convince me that they're happy by telling me so. But they can't say so without getting angry about it. I'm very happy, thank you. You know, I mean, just not happy. And just miserable. Well, I'll tell you why, because they don't believe in the resurrection. Now, let's go ahead and flip that and and let's, let's get to the converse side of it. Why in the world wouldn't a Christian be happy? Sin. Yeah, sin. Or maybe they just kind of got off a little bit theologically and forgot about the resurrection. Do you know it's a perspective issue, isn't it? I don't know if you're this way or not, but I've found that big, big problems don't bother me much. I hope this doesn't happen, but we deal with it if it did. If you called me tomorrow and said, Pastor, the church burned down, the church building burned down, I'd say, well, is anybody hurt? And you'd say, no, but I mean, like, it's gone. You know what? <laughs> I'd be like, well, <laughs> it's going to be an interesting week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that's about it. Uh, but I'll get upset over the stupidest little thing. This is the dumbest little thing. I'll come out and some little thing broken on my car and I'll just be mad at my car and upset about it. I don't know why. I just get upset over just... I can fix anything on my car or I can get another car. It's really not a big deal. But I get upset over little stupid things. <clears throat> Unless I just remember the value of eternity. You know, when it comes to the allotment of my time and what I do... Um, Priorities. Priorities are really important. You know, it's it's amazing the things that need to be done, but you realize that everything that needs to be done can't be done. Now, I don't know how that all works out, but I just know that I'll go to the grave with things undone. Projects not finished. Uh, plans of things I was going to do, not tasks uncompleted. I mean, I'm just... I just know I'm inadequate to do everything that I should do. I've just found you ever have you done everything that you should do? You've gotten everything you ought to do done? You never will. But when I keep an eternal perspective and I realize I have eternal life, I realize that anything that's in this life that doesn't get done doesn't really matter that much. But eternal things that don't get finished actually matter a whole lot. There's a lot of implications with the resurrection. In other words, if I don't preach the gospel to a lost person and they and they go into eternity, it doesn't really matter what I did instead. That's the thing that ought to have been a priority for me. You know, if we get through the year and we get all our little church projects, we didn't get all our church projects done this year, did we? We got a lot done. We didn't get all our little church projects done this year. We're not going to. I'm going to tell you something. If we haven't preached the gospel like we should have, it's because we're not mindful of the resurrection. Now, I understand we live in this life. The, the, Paul told uh, the believers, he said, you know, when we separate from 
um, unbelievers. He says, not the unbelievers in this world. He said, if we're going to do that, we'd have to go all together out of the world. Don't be hermits. We have to live here. We have to function here. But let's function while we're mindful that the gospel we believed is that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And Christ is risen. And so Paul's preaching was not in vain. Your preaching is not in vain. You're not yet in your sins. <laughs> you're saved from your sins. And you're not miserable. You don't just have hope of Christ in this life. You ever met somebody, they, they don't believe in eternal life, and yet they're religious? That's bonkers to me. It's absolutely bad. I don't get it. I've met people, they go to church like every Sunday, or they're involved in a religion. And I've told people many times, if, if, I, if I weren't born again, I wouldn't darken the doors of a church, I promise you. Because your faith is vain. If it isn't real, if it isn't true, it's a waste of time. Oh, there's a lot of good, there's no good that comes from religion. There's no good. I agree with the atheist about that. Religion is pure evil. That's a fact. But friend, there's nothing evil about the resurrection. It's true. And Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. And the implications of it are things that we can rejoice for and we can give thanks for. Father, thank you for what we've learned from the scripture tonight. And I pray that you would help us with the absorbing and the and the uh, retaining of it so that it would so that it would affect our thinking the way we live. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Before we're finally dismissed this evening, uh, I'd like to go ahead and take some prayer requests. I understand if if you're pressed to be somewhere and you have to slip out, uh, we wouldn't be offended by that at all. But let's go ahead and take take some time to uh, share burdens this evening. Anyone? Yes, Brother John? I have a prayer for my wife Sharon that she'll be completely healed and be able to Yes. All right. He had good news that uh, seems like things are going well or better for her and she's uh, improving. So let's pray that she'll be completely healed and be able to come down here soon. All right? Yes. I got a phrase. Um, about a week or so ago, I had a bunch of tests done and it was all good results, medical tests. Yes. So. Praise the Lord. Brother Tim had a bunch of tests done about a week or so ago and had great results. Amen. Who else? All right. Pray for the folks that are traveling. A uh, number of people that are gone for Thanksgiving, including Charlie. And uh, pray for uh, pray for a number of people that aren't saved yet. I think particularly my neighbors, Julio and Sylvia. And. Uh, Man, I, I, have you heard from them? No, that's what I was going to say. I, ha I haven't heard from them. It's not because they haven't responded. I haven't called them. I've intended to call them several times. and so. But generally, generally, their plans, when they plan to come back, they're usually a few weeks later than they plan on. And if, when they leave to go back to New York, they're a few weeks later as far as that goes. Just things, just hard when you get to the age where everything in your life revolves around doctor's appointments and medication coming in the mail and that sort of thing and so but let's pray for Julio and Sylvia uh, you know the last thing that he told me when I shared the gospel with him was soon so you know when I said when are you going to get saved Julio he said well soon well he's um, he needs to get saved right away so let's pray for for Julio and for Sylvia for them to trust Jesus who else all right uh, could yes. I ask Kim how's your mom is any um, she's moved. She's in Seattle now. So yeah. she's she needs to be saved. Yeah, so we'll continue <laughs> to pray for her salvation. Yeah. yeah. And let's pray for Charlie's dad. Charlie's dad was in, he was not there Sunday, was he? He was there last Sunday. He wasn't there, right? Yeah, two weeks ago. Pray for Charlie's dad to be saved. He's been coming pretty regularly to Miami Beach. He wasn't there this last Sunday, but he's been coming to church, and for Charlie, that just blows his mind. He's uh, been praying for his dad to be saved for years, and it's really a just amazing thing. And let's pray about uh, Brother White went down to Miami Beach. Dustin um, purchased a, bun a, a list of new home buyers or people that are new to the community in Miami Beach, and so I think they got about, I don't know, 400 or so people that have moved in recently. 500 people move in and out of Miami Beach every month. That's amazing, isn't it? I mean, it's South Florida, but it's just 500 in and out every month. And so pray for the folks that they're trying 
Dustin's going to be back Monday, and they're going to be going out every day trying to reach the people that are new to Miami Beach. And so pray about that, that, that the Lord will give, um, just, just give them good inroads and that we'll see people saved. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight, shall we? Father, we rejoice in the things that you have so richly blessed us with. And God, tonight I'm just reminded by the Scripture of how great our salvation is and how simple our salvation is. And Lord, religion has attempted to conceal or to make a profit of the Gospel, but that isn't the Gospel. And the Gospel is, is that Jesus died and was buried and rose again. And Lord, the implications of it this evening are that because you actually, Jesus is risen, our faith isn't vain. Lord, what we believe is worth something. And help us to remember that. Help us not to feel as though we're living, in, living for you in vain. And God, our hope isn't just in this life. It's for eternity. So I pray that you would just help us to be able to simply preach the gospel and simply believe it. Now, Father, we bring our prayer requests before you, recognizing that you've already answered prayer. We're praying for safety and, and God, for you to provide the way for Tim as he moved his mother a week ago. And uh, Lord, you allowed that all to take place. I pray for the salvation of his, of his mother and that you just give him the opportunity to simply present the gospel for her. Then I pray as Lord, thank you as well for the great test results that he had. And what a God, just what a relief and a burden lifted that that is. And uh, we rejoice in your goodness for him in that. And then God, I pray for Sharon. I thank you that she is a lot better already. And I pray that you would completely heal her. And then I pray for. Um, Julio and Sylvia, God, I just think of uh, how important it is for them to be saved. Literally, both of them have the kind of health where they don't know that they have today or even tomorrow. And Lord, I just, I just plead with you that you would convict them and show them the need for salvation before they pass into eternity. Help them to come back safely and soon. I pray for Charlie's dad to be saved, for Tim's mom to be saved, and uh, for Tony's brother and and for his family and their spiritual needs. God, I just think of this season of the year, the time when so many people are, feel so alone and they're struggling and suffering through depression. Lord, we who have hope in Jesus Christ, we're not going through these things that they are. So help us to be compassionate. And help us out of compassion to share the gospel with people and help them to see that they can have hope. Lord, I pray for the believers that we would testify more than ever uh, of the hope that's in Jesus Christ. And we just praise you for what we'll see done as a result. <clears throat> Pray for Miami Beach and the outreach that's happened there in the last couple of weeks and even yesterday. And I pray for uh, this new contacts list and that you give the Duke family safety as they come back. And God just encourage their hearts as they preach the gospel. And that may we see uh, lives saved and changed as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being here tonight. Happy Thanksgiving.